structure of architecture in terms of types, I would like to qualify this in a very serious way. So let us consider the conclusions again. Okay, I've spoken about that enough. Let me pass on to the next point. With respect to this primary event, the event of habitation, the practice of architecture has to be considered secondary. One could therefore characterize architecture as a responsive practice. Oh, yeah, am I? In that it is constitutive of this practice that it responds to processes that precede it and this uh, in a subject, um, oh well, let, let us stop it there. I've made that point, okay. If architecture is always a response to the primary processes of habitation, this points to the fact that a very substantial part of the sources of the greatness of architecture cannot be found in its own practice, but are situated outside of it, namely in the quality of life of the people who use uh, and visit the building. I do not mean to say, for instance, that Madame Savoy will for all eternity have the last word on the quality of a villa against Le Corbusier. What I do claim is that Le Corbusier is vindicated in his innovative design only when it could be demonstrated at least that the kind of architecture of which Villa Savoie sets the paradigm makes a meaningful contribution to people's ability to inhabit the world well and where the people concerned have the authoritative judgment on it. In this sense, one could say that architecture has to justify itself to much more than to the architectural fraternity or the architectural tradition or to the cause of creativity, although I obviously don't exclude the importance of those. But architecture has to justify itself, first of all, in the relations that it as practice imposes on society. In other words, it has to be judged in terms of the response, the facilitation or frustration that the construction entails in people's ongoing habitation. Now this point has to be uh, developed, uh, has to be developed, I'll do so uh, very shortly. In the preceding discussion, I've contextualized the architect's concern about types to the practices in which they come to play. However, let us distinguish architecture as action and architecture as the accomplishment, that means as a construction. As action, the practices of design and construction in architecture are events through which the plurality of divergent and conflicting types involved in the design decision have to be negotiated. If architecture is the practice of types, it is so only as practice. That is, the competence and living action of considering, consciously or not, the different character, functional, collective and value types relevant to the task. These types are not merely applied, sorry, these types are not merely applied, but are weighed against each other. Working with anonymous types, the complex task of coordinating different concerns necessarily gives rise to judgment, that is, to the considered opinion, not about what is right or correct, the right or the correct solution to a problem, but the considered opinion of what is the best compromise between the contradictory demands entailed in the divergent series of types. As judgment about anonymous types, architecture is the attempt to find a particular solution to the design problem in the complex context of a particular design. I move on to my uh, almost last point. Architecture is also the name of an accomplishment of architectural action. Through the construction of the design, the judgments of the architect to which I referred just now gain objective reality. 
They become part of the world of artifacts among which people dwell. And here I anticipate on uh, what I cannot develop completely. I'll give you just a uh, kind of a foretaste of that. Let us think again about human beings dwelling in the world. One way in which people make themselves at home in the world is by striving to live in a justified world. That is, a world that is not simply chaotic or arbitrary, but a world in which one can live in a justifiable or even a just manner with others. Most often social actors do not even realize that they are striving towards such a form of habitation. But when problems arise and their familiar way of dwelling in the world is undermined, they shift gears. They deploy the capability of justifying or the negative counterpart critiquing what seems to, what seems to be required to make of the world one that can be experienced as justified or just. These social actors do so by citing particular facts. They mobilize as evidence for how the world should be or should not be. They mobilize as evidence particular things, people and events in such a way that this mobilization ca can lay claim to general support. General support means all or most members of a community should agree that it is to their detriment, harmful to their efforts to live well in the world, to overlook the significance of the cited factors for the common good. But there are numerous great ideas about the common good. And since, despite being in mutual contradiction, they all enjoy some form of support, social actors have to find their home in compromise between different ideas of the common good. Now, architecture as an accomplishment, as objectified judgment, is an enduring claim to ways in which such factors of common good should be coordinated in a singular compromise. In this capacity too, architecture intervenes in the ongoing processes of habitation. Situated in this manner, constructions will also be ready to be mobilized by capable social actors in their efforts to justify or critique the world in which they live. The greatness of the world in which we live can be derived from certain architectural phenomena just as the greatness of that guy you call doctor is derived from certain proofs like the certificate against the wall, the way in which the timetable is used, the stethoscope and so on and so forth. Perhaps you have not thought of expressing this idea in this fashion as I do just now, but you have implicitly consented to the validity of thinking in this way. You have in fact mobilized architectural features and claims about the common good every time you have questioned the justness of having separate doors for whites and blacks, every time you have noted the difficulty for a handicapped person to enter a particular building, every time you have been surprised by the careful manner in which an architect has taken account of local traditions in a design, every time you have asked questions about the manner in which a building would tend to facilitate people meeting or keeping them apart and so on and so forth. These are the conclusions to which I wanted to work in this presentation. I have one last short conclusion. In the preceding, if the preceding discussion is more or less accurate, then the use of typology, one's understanding of human beings and of the good life, of compromises and of judgments about these are far from trivial. In fact, they are essential structuring aspects of the practice of architecture. But nobody can dispute that these issues are the daily bread of the humanities and the social sciences. And if this is the case, then one has to conclude that a dialogue, a dialogue between architects, philosophers, and the human and social sciences on these issues should be considered an indispensable program 
for all of these parties concerned. Thank you for your attention. or way or position, for want of a better word, uh, that they can adopt uh, to be able to predict the successful appropriation or habitation of particularly public buildings uh, for all these various users and the various types of um, I would imagine that if you wanted to uh, get some uh, knowledge about that, you know, to advance beyond mere guessing, that you would have to see if somebody has not made a study of that. For instance, by drawing up a catalog of the kind of spaces that architects are capable of creating, I mean a reasonable series of them that could be taken as prototypes, and see what the kind of actions are that people commonly um, embark on when confronted with these. Like, for instance, a space narrowing that leads up to an opening and so on. You know all of those uh, uh, things that I think can be used with a fair amount of um, certainty about its success. However, one has to realize that human beings are extraordinarily creative. They do what they want. Right? That, that is how it is. I mean, there is nothing that protects your precious design against the new amendments, also called improvements isn't it? Because, I mean, for this, it has been an extraordinary experience for me to visit Villa Savoie. I mean, I don't have to tell you that Villa Savoie is one of the, one of the greatest buildings of the last um, century, or yes, it was about a century ago that it was built, right? And there in the house today, you can find the letters that Madame Savoie wrote to Le Corbusier. And I can tell you the water of the sea couldn't wash him clean. No, she didn't like that house. My point is, she's right. You cannot start by saying, oh, listen, haven't you uh, read your Architecture 101 handbook? You will know that you are living in a great building. It doesn't work that way. First, you have to start by saying, Madame Savoie, we are sorry. We tried, we made an experiment on you. But then... I mean, you can go and make a study, you know, see what the things are, for instance, that Madame Savoie complained about, and ask yourself, well, have other people tried it? Have other people complained about it? Perhaps we should try to avoid that kind of thing, and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, just a very simple example. We, we have it right here in front of us. It is easier for an audience to listen to somebody when they can see the speaker and the speaker can see them. Right, so the guy who designed this got something right. I don't think for one moment that everybody listened to me all of the time, huh? You know what I'm saying? I'm speaking. <laughs> no, I think you, um, if you take the example of, of Villa Savoie, I think you are, are simplifying the issue at hand because when Le Corbusier designed the house, it wasn't a procedure, it was a design. That means he didn't know what the eventual outcome of, of the design of the building would have been. So in a certain sense, it's experiment. And part of our work that we do every day is experimental. It's not like flying a plane. If you fly a plane, you know that you switch on this switch and you switch on that switch. And if you do all of the procedures correctly, you will land the plane on the other end of the road. So, but, but, but architecture is not the same. And Le Corbusier didn't, he was busy with a new invention and he didn't understand the, the total consequences of that intervention. So it's not, it's not as, as that we can um, sort of procedurally lay our process down and every time we bake the same cake. It doesn't work like that. It's far more, more complex than that. Yes, most, I most agree with you. And the uh, last part of my presentation in which I speak about judgment, I emphasize exactly this point. Um, I fully accept that architectural design is not a procedure. Right. 
Although one would have to say that probably the good architecture has to have a checklist to see if the, uh, the crudest of errors have been avoided. Right. Um, but for the rest, I fully accept it and I define it there in the end of my presentation that architecture has to do with design. Right, okay. But there is absolutely no way that you can say that Le Corbusier is justified in what he did because he was experimenting. He wasn't commissioned to make an experiment. He was commissioned to make an intervention in the life of Madame et Monsieur Savoie that could reasonably be expected to facilitate the habitation of the world. I think the design, as it is on paper, could fulfill that, uh, that um, idea. And besides, architecture as practice is characterized by the same uh, uh, limits, the same fallibility as any human action is. One of the part of the uh, presentation that I couldn't develop here is a use of Anthony Giddens's action theory. All action leads to intended and unintended consequences and obviously something like the partial failure of a design counts as that. I mean what Le Corbusier probably didn't count on was the amount that the French state would uh, make yearly with the tourism surrounding uh, that building either. Right, it's also an unexpected outcome. So there's no difference between us when it comes to uh, reducing architecture to procedure. No question about that. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, agree on architecture being pure experiment. Pure experiment is a characteristic of fine art. If you look back and you can visit the building, the, um, the amount of knowledge that, that Le Corbusier imparted to the world in terms of the new language for architecture was far greater than what Madame Savoie's letter because that, that building changed the way that we think about architecture. So yes, I think we are, we are reducing... What I, what I said here too. One is what contribution was made to the architectural vocabulary, right? That is uh, also what I, uh, what I said there. The important thing is that at, certain, at a certain point, one has the right to ask, okay, so what does this contribute? So if you continue to have um, uh, buildings in the style of Villa Savoie, and time and time again, the architect defends himself or herself by saying, this is an experiment, you have to bear with me, but never does it produce a house that people are satisfied with, then I would say, well, this is not architecture anymore. I do not say that, I want to emphasize this, I do not reduce the quality of the, architect, uh, of the architect's work to the first user or the first client's experience of that. But sooner or later, the cumulative effect of all of the people involved in that, it is their opinion that counts. Right. Even if it is indirectly through what can be generated in other buildings through the vocabulary uh, figured out in a very creative building. I mean, I used it as an example, but I'm sure they knew that they were not asking the, the first architect uh, next door, right? So they must have been expecting something like that. And I fully agree with what you imply there, that one should, in, a, in a, uh, an elaboration of the study, work out the specific relations engaged in something like building uh, a house from a public building from that space and that and so on and so forth. Absolutely. And that uh, uh, the individual commissions a house can allow uh, the, or grant the architect more space, space for creativity and, uh, and um, uh, innovation uh, speaks for itself. So if, 
uh, no problem with that. But I don't think that it contradicts anything that I've, uh, that I've said here. this um, description that you've had of architecture. Um, I think that there have been attempts in the past to do architecture that is, doesn't think about the wellness of habitation or that it's supposed to be totally useless or totally superfluous or, um, you know, it is just there. I'm thinking, for instance, of another house, Villa Rotunda, which is purely an idea and it is not supposed to be lived in at all. And um, whether you would allow in this construct of architecture to say well, that that has legitimacy, or whether it is almost an illegitimate activity for architects to engage in. Yes. Very difficult uh, question, and it is uh, uh, closely related to the kind of concerns with which I uh, grappled towards the uh, end of my presentation when I try to bring in the idea of particularity in judgment and compromise and things like that. The question is, um, is an idea uh, necessarily, or an architectural idea necessarily a type? I'm not sure about that. My tendency now would be to say no, not necessarily, but it can become one. Like for instance, you could have an architect who simply designs by making a compromise between all of the divergent uh, requirements implied by the types involved, the uh, uh, anonymous types involved in a certain design task, but then comes to a compromise solution. That, that is an idea, all right? But an idea may become a paradigm again. So the, the idea in the first case would then be uh, very clearly uh, um, not, not a simply a type, but a, a compromise between types. You know, that is the way in which I've introduced the idea of particularity. Uh, but that it could then, I mean, you know, you know the, the phenomenon of fake types. Toscan houses in Pretoria, as somebody uh, in this very venue, I think, discussed a few years ago. Um, designing a house as an experiment, well, why not? But then we all know what it is there for. It's an experiment. So you go to the house, don't try to live in it. It will hurt. Try to, <laughs> you know, walk through it and see what you can learn from it. And that is what it is for. So it's just another kind of architect and possible user uh, relation. Right, thank you very much.